Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here for a very special edition where we are being joined by folks from Chalkbeat. Chalkbeat.org is a great place for uh, listeners to go to get information about what's going on in K-12 education. It was always a great resource for that. And as K-12 has become the fulcrum of a lot of our attention lately. We're joined by three folks from Chalkbeat today. We have Sarah Darville, who's the managing editor of Chalkbeat. Sarah helped pull this together. And then we have Matt Barnum uh, and Kaylin Belsha, who are national reporters at Chalkbeat. And really happy to, to have all of you on the show. Lots to dig into. Maybe just to begin with, with you, Sarah, how's it been over at Chalkbeat the last six months, last seven months? I know it's been an interesting ride 2020 for all of us, but I imagine as an organization that's trying to track what's going on in K-12 in 2020, it must have been one, one hell of a ride. Yeah, I don't think we've seen anything like this ever. We often have these news moments where it's all hands on deck and then they're over. And yeah. this has been that moment for six months. Mm. So it's, yeah, it's been a really intense time. Also, especially for our local teams at Chalkbeat, we have local reporting teams in I think, mm. eight cities and they have the the day-to-day -day responsibility too of helping uh, families understand like are my kids in school tomorrow yeah. so it's been especially intense for them and then also for us just trying to make sense of what this looks like across the country it's yeah, yeah it's been wild yeah yeah and a lot of interesting uh, partnerships and pickups of work that Chalkbeat's been doing which is definitely something we are going to want to dig into and it is a little bit like the equivalent of wartime journalism for education journalism this year the amount of just shifts of focus shifts of attention that you've needed to go through and then also chalkbeat's orientation is much more connected to the humans who are delivering the education receiving it the parents and then obviously the students themselves typically the way we kick our conversations off is we ask each of our guests to give us uh, their origin story. I think we're going to begin with you, Kaylin. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. So yeah, I grew up in Long Island in New York. I went to public school as a kid. I think I was always really interested in just what happens inside of schools. I went to a really big high school. It was really diverse. And I went to a relatively white, small liberal arts college, private, had very different experiences. And then when I got to journalism school, like between different tracks, and I was really interested in urban studies and focused on immigration early on, and then became an education beat reporter and have been one for the last seven years. I've lived here in Chicago for a long time. So I started as a suburban reporter here and then mm -hmm. covered uh, Chicago public schools for a couple of years and then uh, transitioned to the national desk. So yeah. I approach my beat as someone who is grounded in local reporting. Yeah. And you've been on that beat through 2020. Is that right? And then I believe you've been focusing more on like the stories of educators and parents uh, and families, uh, kids. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I've been on the beat for about a year and a half now. Uh -huh. I do focus a lot on what educators are seeing in the classroom and what parents are seeing. Awesome. Fantastic. Uh, and then uh, Matt, how about you? Sure. Yeah. I started my career as a teacher and worked for two years as a middle school teacher and became interested in educational policy and was working in educational policy and what changed my trajectory was becoming more aware of this whole realm of educational research. Mm -hmm. And that sounds even weird to say to become aware of that. Of course, we all know there's like research, like that's a thing. But to me, I didn't fully realize that there are hundreds of people whose literal jobs are to study educational policy, study what is effective and what is not effective. And every one of us have our own personal opinions about education policy, about what works and what doesn't, and they're not necessarily grounded in any sort of research. Mm -hmm. and part of that is because research will get published in these academic journals that a few people read, yeah. and very difficult to understand. And so I became really interested in, through journalism, trying to explain mm -hmm. what we know and what we don't know from educational research. And, yeah. and how charge is, uh, is bigger and is not just focused on educational research, but I often write about new research studies or how prior research studies can help us understand yeah. um, different issues at play. Yeah. Yeah. We talk a lot about that on this show, the connection between theory and practice. And also there's been a, a lot of talk about science communication as a new thing, but I think there's a related 
social science communication and uh, educational research, I think is a really interesting space, particularly this year too. So I imagine yeah. just like, like all of you, I would imagine this year folks are probably making connections in their heads that y'all have thought about for, for quite some time. So more folks are probably looking for research that they can then apply to the radical transformations that have happened uh, this year, particularly around the move online. There's a lot of research, Sarah, that, that you and team have been doing. So we do want to get to that. But before we want to hear your origin story too, it's, it's, it's only fair. So what got you to, to where you are? My route to this kind of started with a lot of the really emotional fights about schools and charter schools during the Michael Bloomberg era here mm -hmm. in New York City. I have been randomly assigned by my college paper to cover local schools and ended up at some some meetings that were just incredibly emotional and mm. were full of parents from the same neighborhood who had totally opposite views of what education should look like and like the building down the street and there mm. were people were screaming and crying and there were police officers there and I yeah. was just like what I didn't know education policy was this. I mm -hmm. didn't know that there could be so many people who are convinced that they're doing the right thing and operating in good faith and still be so far apart. Yeah. And so I just became obsessed with understanding how that came to be and what that meant and eventually found the organization that was then called Gotham Schools, which was this like budding organization that was trying to cover mm. these really fraught debates and have been affiliated with them in some way for the last many years. Yeah. And that was Gotham Schools, which became Chalkbeat. And then also the focus has expanded to become not just the local embedded focus, but also rolling that up to more of a national focus, which I imagine is still the federalist uh, country that we're in there's always going to be a blend of local and national, but the national in some ways probably winds up being local or at least localized. Is that right? And then your focus yeah. is on the national side now. Is that right? right. Or, so, yeah. and that sort of mirrors my, I was a New York city reporter, then New York city editor. And then as we were growing and had reporters in different places, we were seeing more and more that like we were telling the similar stories in, in multiple places and wanted ways to try to, connect those dots and also yeah. just keep in our understanding of the connection between the local and the national in yeah. education, which is a really local issue. And that is yeah. like a tension that like, and I'm, I'm really glad Chalkbeat is structured this way because it mm -hmm. allows us to understand it at both levels. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where I was going too, is that there's a lot of talk and we talk often about diversity of perspectives and how it ultimately makes your process better. And I imagine when you're aggregating the local information to a national level, and then you can start to connect the dots, compare and contrast, you can start to tease out really interesting trends. And that's part of what, what we're really here to talk about. You've been doing a lot of really interesting work and I would recommend it's chalkbeat.org for folks uh, who, who are curious. There's a lot of stuff there. I think we've used you in the past to source some of our information, but but I think particularly this year, there's been research that you've done. I know there's there's also an article of yours, Sarah, that was picked up in, in the New York Times about some of the complexities of reopening schools, uh, which we definitely want to want to get into. But a lot seems to have been tied, at least in my reckoning, to this research that you did with the Associated Press heading into the summer to do some analysis of what different schools and school districts and parts of the country are doing heading into the fall. And then that research was super interesting. And then the reality that what you understand in August is very different from what we'll be living in October is also something that I think we've all come to understand. But maybe just beginning with you, Sarah, can you talk a little bit about the Associated Press research that, that Chalkbeat did and then I think from there, we could probably start to bring in Matt and Kaylin where appropriate, just to start to round out what's the perspective on the state of K-12 education, particularly as it relates to the fall and what we've seen so far. And then this should be coming out right around the election, right on the other side of the election. So I think it's just a crazy time. Folks are looking for help. But I, th I think just to, to do some initial framing, can you begin with a little context around the joint thing that you did with the Associated Press? Yeah, so we, we partnered with them in an attempt to survey school districts in each state 
and try to find out, like we had hunches and we, there's, you know, obviously tons of local reporting being like, here's the plan in this district and here's the plan in this other district. So we were curious looking at it from a bigger picture perspective. And Mm -hmm. the Associated Press did a lot of the heavy lifting there in terms of the surveying. And we played a role in that too. And the finding there was, I think we ended up with 670 something school districts and their plans were really different. And again, this was really like the plan for day one, as, as you mentioned, and some of these, those plans have changed. We found that a lot of school districts, especially school districts that were serving mostly students of color, were starting online only. Mm -hmm. It was like 79% of Hispanic students, 75% of Black students, and about half of white students wouldn't have the option of in-person learning at the very start of the school year. Obviously, that was an interesting disparity there. Yeah, yeah. And then just to round it out, beginning with you, Kaylin, what uh, trends were you seeing around perceptions from educators and from parents. Are are there any ways to humanize the numbers and talk about it across the different perspectives that you cover? Yeah, I think one of the most interesting parts of that work that we did was that we saw it really cut across the kinds of school districts across the country. So that finding held true in cities, in suburbs, in towns, in rural areas. Mm -hmm. And I think before that, the narrative had really been that more rural areas were more likely to go back. But when we saw that there were more students of color to enroll, that founding did hold true across the country. So I think a lot of the parents that we talked to for that story, we made sure to talk with folks in suburbs and see how they were feeling. And we heard just a lot of the same concerns that we heard from folks in cities. A lot of concern about their family or people they knew having been disproportionately hurt by the virus or having pre-existing conditions that would make them and their children more um, vulnerable to it. We talked to one mom who was in the suburbs of Philly And she had a pre-existing condition and was just very grateful that the school district had started online, even though she knew it made her life way harder. She was multitasking her own job and she was overseeing virtual school. And we've heard that time and time again, that even when folks know how hard it will be, there's still some kind of wariness about not wanting to be exposed to the virus and to keep Mm -hmm. themselves and their kids safe, even though there's been some evolving research about how likely kids are to pass it on and how likely they are to get very sick. Um, We're still seeing that kind of holding true now. We're seeing in a lot of surveys, parents of color are still pretty wary. Yeah. And I'd be curious if there are any disparities between what was initially found in the Associated Press research and then what you're actually seeing as the policies at a local level are shifting as we speak. The other thing I just wanted to hit on real quick while you're talking, Kaylin, is the the article about teaching in person and virtual at the same time, which I know got a little bit of pickup. And it's something, full disclosure, I've worked in uh, e-learning for a long time, and we did a lot of quote unquote simulcasting along the way. And I thought that was really interesting from the perspective of what's it like to teach to those two disparate groups at the same time without a more thoughtful instructional design and maybe more resources to support that. Can you just hit that note real quick? Because I thought that was an interesting article. Yeah, I think the logistics of putting a hybrid plan in place has been one of the most complicated things we've been reporting on. And in places that they have gone back, that's been one of the main sticking points is around how do you staff these classrooms when there are still a significant number of children learning from home. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what the stopgap measure has been is to ask teachers to do both at once. Mm -hmm. And among the teachers I interviewed, I would say the teachers who are working with younger learners were definitely struggling way more because the attention span of those kids is shorter. They don't understand that they have classmates at home. Mm -hmm. It's also really Really hard for teachers who work with kids with disabilities. Yeah. So it's certainly better than no in-person learning, but they have said that this isn't necessarily something they got training or prepared for, which has yeah. made it just really hard. Yeah. Yeah. It gets back to the point that we were talking about before where fight or flight is supposed to subside. The whole idea is you, you get that influx of stress reaction so that you can either fight it or run in either case you either win the fight or you get to safety and i think what a lot of people are struggling with this year is that it's both a marathon and a sprint at the same time and i think burnout is a real thing providing the right level of social emotional support there's a lot of talk about providing grace really across the board but i but i think it's nice to see the the human element incorporated into these stories because i think a lot of times these stories really ultimately are very personal, very individual. And also we come with our own 
preconceptions and biases, and sometimes they're wrong. I did want to bring you in, Matt, on the realities of the spring and then what's that meant. I know you've done some coverage around school budgets really throughout and what we may see as we look ahead. As we all know, COVID-19 has really hit the economy hard. And when we think about that, we don't usually think about how that impacts schools as part of the economy. But of course, they're funded by tax dollars raised through the economy. So when people are not going out and buying things, the sales Mm -hmm. tax revenue dries up. When people are losing income, income tax revenue drives up. And that's what schools are very reliant on. They're also Mm -hmm. reliant on property taxes, though those tend to be less affected, at least in the short term, by a recession. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are really concerned about, look, how are schools going to be able to get the funding that they need in the midst of this pandemic-fueled recession? Yeah. And so there's some, from the perspective of public school budgets, there's some good news and bad news. The good news is Congress did pass something, the CARES Act, which they passed in late March, and that gave $13 billion to public schools, a little more than $13 billion, which sounds like a lot. It is but it's about 200 bucks per, per student. Mm-hmm. And that's a, actually a pretty small fraction of what we spend. So that has helped public schools. A lot of states, what they did, because they were facing their own recessionary crisis, they took that CARES Act funding, and then they just cut the public school fund, their state funding for public schools by the exact same amount. Mm-hmm. So for some school districts, they didn't see anything more from the federal dollars because mm-hmm. it was effectively canceled mm-hmm. out. The other piece of good news, though, is the the full effect has really not been felt by state budgets and school budgets yet. It takes time for states to start to really feel the pain of the recession, and usually school budgets are falling on a bit of a time delay. So this year, it doesn't seem to have been that bad for school districts. They also maybe saved money while they've been closed remotely. They may have furloughed some staff. They may have saved money from not having to run buildings or pay substitutes. Mm -hmm. The the bad news is a lot of people are really concerned about the longer term, the next couple years, particularly if there's not a new federal package, both to provide additional funding for public schools for their new costs, like personal protective equipment, improving ventilation systems, and to fill in the gaps in state budgets because the state budgets are almost certainly going to be and are taking a real hit. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really interesting to think about the choice that parents and families are making, whether they even can entertain the choice of sending their kids to school. And then how do you budget properly to design a school that could be somewhat flexible to accommodate the the real decisions that families are going to make? I'm here in New York City and the percentage of families that are opting out of in-person learning Uh, which winds up being a hybrid version of in-person in New York, but it's a significant uh, percentage. And when you're allocating funds, that's why, like I thought the article about the challenges of hybrid teaching is really interesting because if you think about it from a budgeting perspective, it's relatively understandable to say, we'll put a, we'll put a camera in the back of the class that'll stream out to the remote attendees, or you'll do it from your laptop. We're done. And I think the reality is going to be much more complicated. And then folks haven't necessarily had the time to ever really catch their breath and think about this from maybe a more calm, reflective, and strategic perspective. Maybe coming back to you, Sarah, like how has Chalkbeat been navigating that where you both need to be on top of what's just in? Everything is so current. There is a lot of really urgent suddenness to the news that's happening. But at the same time, you probably want to have some perspective into what's coming down the line or where you want to get to so that you're out ahead of things. I imagine the chalkbeat, you have to be ready to respond to whatever might happen out there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think to some of what you were saying earlier, I think that's why Kalen's reporting has been so thoughtful and helpful because I think there is this idea too, once we're back, like that's the finish line. Mm-hmm. And we know some families are not going to go back until you know, maybe until there's a vaccine, mm-hmm. which means we're always going to be figuring out how to teach those students from afar and yeah. potentially at the same time, mm-hmm. or when students with disabilities are coming back, it's not like we just revert back to nine months from now. There's a lot of stuff that's just, that's still different. And even going back is often just not the same experience. Mm -hmm. So I think we're thinking a lot about how to report out what that looks like over the next 
entire school year because like yeah. this whole school year is going to be totally different even if more and more students end up back in school over time. Mm-hmm. So that's definitely on our minds and is, it, it, we're not just focused on are they in school or are they out of school? <laughs> the experience of what school actually feels like for both groups of students matters a lot too. Yeah, we're recording this just before the election but we want to get a sense of what things might be like on the other side and how folks who are activated about education and the future of learning where could they go? What sorts of things are y'all looking at? So Sarah, maybe beginning with you and then we could do a quick around the horn. What do you see on the horizon? How are you managing your own perspective on this? Any thoughts really would be great. Yeah, we are looking to next week as everyone in the country is. Who knows what exactly is coming next? I don't think it can be overemphasized how much part of what Matt was talking about is really going to shape so much of what the next, not just few months, but several years looks like. If our decisions about how much money we end up sending to schools are going to affect whether schools have to lay off staff across the country, whether or not we have a fighting chance of helping students make up the academic ground that they've lost. Right. Um, it's going to pretty much shape everything that we're covering over the next few years. So mm-hmm. I think that's, that's like a huge thing. And it's not, it's for the president and, but also especially Congress there. And obviously there's a lot of other things that would will look really different depending on the outcome of the election. Kaylin's written a lot about civil rights enforcement, which she can go to get into in more detail. But even just we know that they have different approaches to thinking about how schools should be responding to the virus mm-hmm. and and, and then some things we just don't know, like what will the decision be about standardized testing this year, for example, which is one that I'm personally fascinated yeah. by. I don't think we really have a clear sense, but obviously it's going to be somewhat in that person's hands. Yeah. And uh, the interesting thing also uh, coming out of some of the research that I, I've read from Chalkbeat was that it did look like there was some correlation to the interest in in-person learning based on likelihood to be a Trump versus a, a a more democratic districts. So I thought that was an interesting trend to see. So if you were to extend that forward, if Trump is reelected, you would expect the, more of a continued push to open schools, particularly in Republican districts. I thought that was an interesting uh, politicization of this combination of educational policy and public health policy. Matt, any thoughts on how, say, the next you know three to six months shape up? Anything to be on the lookout for? I'll follow up on, elaborate a bit on one of the things Sarah said, which is testing. Yeah. And uh, testing has become a, a integral part of American schooling system for better or for worse, especially yeah. since No Child Left, Left Behind passed mm-hmm. a couple of decades ago. And federal law basically requires every state to administer testing grades three through eight every single year. Mm-hmm. And last year, for the first time, It was canceled because of COVID-19 and because students weren't in buildings and the Trump administration's Department of Education and Secretary Betsy DeVos said it wasn't doable. They got a lot of pushes from state officials and educators saying, we just can't do it. They said, we agree, it's canceled, Mm -hmm. it's waived. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, can they do it this year? And a lot of state officials and some educators are saying, let's not focus on testing this year. It's actually gonna be really hard to do and get a valid measure. Many students are staying home. We really shouldn't be focusing on testing at this particular moment anyway. Mm -hmm. Also, some people have long been critical of testing, and they see this as a moment to get rid of it anyway. But the Trump administration and Secretary DeVos has said no. At least right now, we are saying plan to go forward with testing. We are probably not going to waive testing this year. These tests are pretty important because they're what's used to hold educators accountable, their information that is provided to parents, also used to hold schools accountable. Some people, though, are hoping that if President Trump loses and Joe Biden wins, that a Joe Biden administration will come in and say, actually, we can cancel testing. Yeah. And there's the politics of this are pretty interesting because Betsy DeVos and the Trump administration have been critical about federal involvement in education, but they are saying, no, we're still going to mandate testing. Yeah. On the other hand, Joe Biden has been very critical about of standardized testing on the campaign trail, but his mm-hmm. campaign hasn't committed to canceling it if he's elected. Mm-hmm. And a lot of left-leaning civil rights groups are very concerned about canceling testing and don't want it canceled because mm-hmm. they think that testing is really important to show opportunity gaps, disparities and opportunities, mm-hmm. and especially this year, learning loss. We will see if a Biden administration comes in how they'll approach that issue. Yeah, that was fantastic because that will be a very core thread to think about moving through this 
all where we talk about grace, but we also talk about learning loss and then and accountability and all these different pieces. It's hard to have all of them at the same time. So it'll be really interesting to see how this unfolds, really regardless of the administration. There's quite a quite a pickle to be in. And then, Caitlin, anything on the horizon for you? Any stories or any particular angles that you think are going to be particularly relevant heading into uh, the rest of the year? And uh, hopefully we make it to a 2021 and then 2021 and beyond. Yeah, I would say the two things I'm watching really closely are how the pandemic affects efforts to um, further school integration and also how it hampers school discipline reform efforts. Mm. I think with the murder of George Floyd, we saw a lot of interest in attacking head-on social injustices. One of them has been school policing and school discipline. I think Mm. there's a lot of momentum there, Mm -hmm. but we're also in a time where kids are facing a lot more challenges with behavior and their emotions as they return to school and whether or not school districts will be able to handle what's happening. Will they be well equipped to properly um, address some of that? And Mm. will that roll back efforts that we've seen to try to take a more restorative approach? Yeah. Um, Especially when there's a lot of health concerns and small behaviors might be treated with a lot more um, scrutiny and might be disciplined more harshly. We're also seeing a lot of bubbling up interest in trying to do voluntary efforts to integrate schools. There's a new coalition that just formed with very large school districts, which we have not seen in the past being interested in participating. Mm -hmm. Whether or not there might be federal money coming down the line for something like that. President Trump has eliminated funding for things like that, hasn't been interested in that. Joe Biden has expressed some interest in doing some modest funding for it, but he himself Mm -hmm. has a really complicated record on school desegregation and has opposed busing for federally mandated um, desegregation plans. So I'm really watching both of those things to see how they play out with both the election and the pandemic. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, especially you you couple with that, the, the concept of digital inclusion and access, the digital gaps that exist, which is why I did think the research about parents' perception of online learning was breaking differently along racial lines, which I thought was, and it may be in a surprising way, because I think the broader perception out there may be black and brown students don't have as much access to digital. They're more likely on a school lunch program, so they're more likely going to be going to their physical school. It was interesting to see some of the research was actually counterindicating that, but in part, really from the perspective of parents who who can't really afford to, to, to send their kids out. It just gets so complicated, which is why uh, credit to y'all for continuing to fight the good, good fight to help us try to sort it out. So yeah, I always love to get my guests perspective on what's new and emerging in the world around us. I know we've been thinking about K-12. You certainly can continue to build on some of the, the foundation that you've laid in terms of what you talked about so far, but also if you wanted to recommend something that just dropped on Netflix, if you have a, a new cocktail that, that you want to recommend, that's fine too. But, but whatever is capturing your attention. We're a trend spotting show. The floor is yours. And, and Caitlin, I'm going to go right back to you. This is like a double dip. It's a, like a snake draft for those of us who do uh, fantasy sports. So yeah, what, what do you see on the horizon? What's new? What's exciting? Well, I have two hot tips. Nice, um, nice. One is find out ways to turn off notifications on your phone. I have recently experimented with doing this and it's mm-hmm. making my life better. Mm-hmm. And find a cocktail you can make with two ingredients. I have been making Manhattans because it only takes two ingredients. Wow. <laughs> That's some, uh, that's some serious. Aaron, that is a very good hot tip. That's some life hack. Like, I need to rebrand this uh, podcast as life hacks. And I think our downloads will go through the roof with tips like that. So thank you. Tough to follow that, Matt, but, but I know you're up for it. So any thoughts, what's emerging, what's got your attention, what's, what's going on out there? I would raise Kaylin one and say, take Twitter off your phone is mm. my life hack. Mm. Take it off completely. Yeah. Twitter. Yeah. In terms of other things, I recently started watching the Hulu show about the pandemic response, Totally Under Control is the name of the, I guess mm. it's a movie documentary. Wow. And if you want to get really mad and frustrated <laughs> about what's gone on with the pandemic in our country, then I recommend that. But if you don't want to get mad and frustrated and want to throw something through the TV, then don't watch that. All right, there you go. So we're making some progress. And I just double doubling back on the turning off notifications and minimizing your cognitive load. The other thing I've been hearing about, I haven't done it, is uh, going grayscale 
your phone. So you only see things in black and white and you don't get as many of the the, the visceral triggers of those red notifications. I, I, have, I can't really make that recommendation because I haven't been able to follow through on it myself, but I thought it was an interesting one uh, to share out there. So Sarah, I know you've been uh, sweating your recommendation, but but it's time. Our listeners are, are really are, are hungry for whatever you got. So any recommendations, anything happening out there in the world that, that you want to make sure we all pay attention to? Okay, I will raise Matt and Kaylin one and say, find a to-go cocktail situation where you don't even have mm. to make it yourself at all. Nice. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I actually, I am happy to recommend a book that is not new at all, but it's probably the book that I read during the pandemic that I've talked about the most and incessantly. It's the book called Sundown Towns, and it looks at the extremely widespread history of sundown towns and the continued policies of racial exclusion in cities and towns across the country. I think it was originally published like 10 years ago. I read it over the summer and I felt like I learned something on every page. So if ever wow. anyone's looking for that kind of a recommendation, I would say go for it. All right. You heard it here. Delete Twitter, turn off your notifications, get a to-go cocktail or make a simple one yourself and uh, grab a copy of Sundown Towns while subscribing to uh, chalkbeat.org's newsletter done and done so amazing conversation would love to continue it y'all are doing amazing work just understanding what's emerging in this crazy time and it's probably nice to realize that folks are paying more attention but it does seem like the work is probably getting a little harder so i think that's a bit of a trade-off but it's good to do meaningful work and i will say that y'all are doing that Thanks again, folks from Chalkbeat, for joining. Thanks to our listeners, as always, for listening to Trending in Education. If you like what you're hearing, tell your friends, share a review, share the love, spread the word. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education. Thanks.